Good morning. Good morning. Rise up. So I got the table again. I might use it for a while. I might walk around. But anyway, I'm just so proud of everybody. Just so proud of our team, our worship team. You know, we're a startup. We don't have officially a worship pastor or a youth pastor or an associate pastor. And I know God's bringing people and and it's it's a beautiful thing to watch. But I just want to thank everyone. Isn't this awesome? Um, they do a good job. These kids come. I mean, they, they have to put up with a lot of technical difficulties. In fact, this monitor went out and it might go out again. So you might not have all the verses today. Um, this stage, we doubled the size of our platform this last week. Thanks to Mark Diaz. Where are you? Mark came and just built all these four new platforms. And just some really good stuff happening around here. Thanks to God and his people. Um, we have... A birthday this week, and just a couple more days, but we thought we ought to celebrate today. Uh, her name is Lori, Lori Perrin. She's very quiet. She doesn't like the spotlight, but, but where is it? So she's back there. She's a wonderful prayer warrior, and she prays a lot behind the scenes with Melinda and Christy and Natalie, and just so much. Um, she's praying for this body, praying for you. So if you get a chance, have a piece of cake or coffee with her. Her name's Lori Perrin. And we love you. And does anybody else, um, yes, we do. Does anybody else have a birthday in the next few days? Because we got a second cake, thinking that maybe there might be another birthday. Is there? Okay. Well, Lori gets double, double anointing, double blessing, and double cake. All right. <clears throat> so I feel like we've been in a series over the last few weeks, and it was totally unintended. Um, you know, we make plans and Holy Spirit orders our steps. And when that happens, the result is always better than any of our plans would have been to begin with. Um, if I were to go back and title the series, I think I would call it Perseverance. Because, and by the way, perseverance means a continued effort to do or achieve something even when it's difficult and takes a long time. So week one, we talked about, you know, uh, Job, I can't find God, went everywhere, front, back, went all around, I couldn't find God. Then we talked about Mary and Martha, and they were waiting for Jesus to heal Lazarus, and he wasn't there. And then, <coughs> excuse me, week two, we talked about uh, empty vessels, infinite God, and the importance of being emptied out, dropless, like empty before God, in order for miracles to begin to flow and for us to have the anointing that God wants to pour into us and out of us. Week three, today, we're going to learn one lesson. But before we do, I just feel like I need to pray. So if you'd just pray with me. Father, I just thank you. Like we sang today, I'm not enough unless you come. Um, will you meet me here today? Lord, I pray for everyone here in this tent and within the sound of uh, my voice. And I pray that you would speak through <laughs> these vocal cords. And that, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> and that... Uh, that nothing that the enemy does would prosper, just like your word says. Instead, Lord, more of you, less of me, less of us, and let your word prosper above all things, even more than we can think or imagine. So thank you for being with us here today, Lord. We love you, we adore you, we worship you, and uh, this is about you. In Jesus' name, amen. So week three, we're going to learn one lesson. Today, you may not need this lesson at this season or at this stage of your life, but many definitely do. And even if you aren't one of them, there will come a point in your life where you absolutely will. The title is Don't Even Think About Quitting. And we're going to start with the Apostle Paul. He's a poster child for perseverance. And it's a verse <coughs> excuse me, that we examined last week when the focus was being empty. It's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. He says, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And that was really fitting because we were talking about vessels poured out, nothing left. He said, I'm already there. And the time of my departure is at hand. Now, this is the part I want to focus on today. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award, award me on that day. And not only me, but to all who crave his appearance. If you crave his appearance, say I. I. That means you just want 
to be with Jesus. You want him here. You want to be with him. When he comes, we're going. We're going to be caught up in the clouds. We're going to do his work until then. But it's all about his appearance and his, not just his appearance, but his presence. Um, Paul says, I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, this is a well-known and often quoted passage, and it's quite significant because it's his last letter. It's the final epistle before Paul's death, before he mar he's martyred. And it shows his unwavering faith and his unyielding love for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have fought the good fight is also significant for believers today because it serves as a stark reminder that the Christian life is a struggle against evil. It is. Within ourselves and in this world, earlier in the same epistle, Paul reminded Timothy to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. All right. I'm just going to have a little special hot ginger. What's in here? I don't know, but it's, got, it's called throat coat. It's a pneumonia killer. Oh, thank you, my sister. Appreciate that. Um, oh, Maverick. Hi, buddy. Hi. You want to have some? Watch this. The guy's a master. Watch what he does. That is worth it. Let the little children come to me, Jesus said. Amen. Here, you pull that side. I'll pull this side. So he, he opens it. He did this for me last week. Amazing. Watch this. <laughs> but watch, he's not done. Thank you, buddy. Is that cool? Half for him, half for me. That's Maverick. Thank you. Okay. So the Greek word, agonizomai, I looked up the pronunciation, kind of like agony. It's translated fought. And it's the original language in scripture. And it says, it means literally to engage in conflict. The word was used in the context of competing in athletic games or engaging in military conflict. And now Paul, considering that he's chained to a Roman soldier when he wrote that, he understands conflict. He understands struggle. Um, it's pretty easy to see how he made this analogy. So I want, I want us to just recap or, or listen to Paul as he recaps his conflicts. Um, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. Do we have that on the overhead? If we do... Okay, if we don't, it's no problem. Don't worry about it. Okay, since we have it, I need a volunteer. Will you read it? Here you go. You don't have to get up. You can just read it right there. Are they servants of Christ? I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been fought more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. One time I was pelted with sticks, I think. Uh, oh. <laughs> Don't worry, sorry, Jarvis. It's just, you know, we're in a fight. So we know who absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Jarvis. I'm gonna pick up where you left off. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. One of those is enough to kill people sometimes. Five times Paul got it. Three times beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been con constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, and in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. This is crazy. I have labored and toiled and I have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I don't feel weak? Who is led into sin and I don't inwardly burn? He says, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Eretus had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. 
but I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. He goes on to, he could go on forever. This guy's been through it all over and over and over and over. And he never quit. And he did it for the sake of the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17, we read for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So number one, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, perseverance brings reward. You can't lose sight of that. Does anybody need notes? Sermon outline, we have them. If you do, raise your hand, we'll get them to you. Perseverance brings what? Reward. How else could James, the brother of Jesus, start his book? Chapter 1, verse 2. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's the reward, that you would be complete. How many don't feel like you're quite done yet? How many feel like you're under construction? Like if you could put caution tape around your car, your body, your house, your conversation, your marriage, whatever it is. How many, I mean, we are under construction. That's why I don't mind seeing raw wood up here and, you know, uh, banner and, and different things that are, you know, kind of not, not done yet. Because it reminds me that we are under construction and God, who has begun a good work in us, is not done. And I personally love that. There's a reward coming. Perseverance brings reward. And that's why it's a good fight. Somebody say good fight. It's a good fight. He says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, <laughs> excuse me, will award me on that day. And not only me, but everybody who craves his appearance, everybody who loves him. <clears throat> and there's something about a good fight. Can we, can we, I mean, there's something about, did you guys see the, the, the image on the front of your, we're going to talk about that, but not just yet. There's something about a good fight. How many can honestly appreciate that? I mean, you know you fought. I fought when I was down. I fought when I was out. I fought when I was sick. I fought when I was tired. I fought when I was broke. Didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. But God sustained me, and I came out okay. He held me up with his righteous right hand. And I fought while I mourned. And I fought through the grief and I fought when they lied about me and I fought COVID and I fought during that divorce and I fought that depression and I fought that anxiety. I don't know what you had to fight through, but there's something about a good fight that shows us who God is and what he put on the inside of us when the chips are down and all your friends have left the building. Something about a good fight. Look at the image on on your on. Actually, let's put it up here. Do we have it, Chloe? Because I got. To, oh, man. Okay, well, you can see it on the front of your, on the front of the uh, sermon outlines. Okay, this is like last Saturday night. Um, I don't really don't follow too many sports these days, but I follow mixed martial arts. I love a good fight. And I'm watching this title fight, and that guy on the bottom has got his neck cranked and blood streaming down his head. This is the champ. His name's Alexander Volkanovsky. He's from uh, Australia. The guy on top is Brian Ortega. He's a challenger. They're challenging for all the marbles, 155 featherweight, I believe. And uh, it's a good fight. I mean, they are going at it. And the champ has got the best. He's getting the best of them. It's close. But the champ is getting the best of them. And in round three, this other guy, the challenger, Brian Ortega, he's known for submissions. Are there any martial, mixed martial arts fans in the building? Anybody like a good fight? Okay. So, so Brian Ortega, he's known to be um, possibly next champ, up and comer, but good at what they call submissions. Submissions are when you get someone in such a compromising position that that they either tap out or go to sleep because they can't breathe. And so the guy on top, he's got him. And it's round three. And he's excellent. He's put most of his guys away through different kinds of submissions. And in this round three, I think it was, he got the champ in that submission. And everybody's like, oh, no, no, it's over, it's over, it's over. And the champ got out. Not just one time. Not just one time. I know we should clap for that. But three times. He got him in two other ones. I mean, like anaconda choke triangle where he's got his head and his arm and, his, and, and the guy's eyes are bugging out. And it's over because you don't, you don't get out of these submissions. But the champ got out. And it was amazing. And for those who want it, I have it upstairs. I bought the pay-per-view. And I get to keep that for a little while. And I would love nothing more than to watch that good fight again. But um, 
it was an amazing thing, and what made it so good is that neither one, champ or challenger, you could see, neither one ever thought about quitting. It never was an option. It, they just went there to do what they were called to do. They fought a good fight. Till it was, you want to know who won? Spoiler? Spoiler? <laughs> champ. Champ is champ for a reason. The guy, the challenger, gave it everything he had, and it was a good fight. And when it was over, he said, we're not defined by our losses. That's what he said. He said, I'm glad I got to be here today, and I'm going back to the drawing board, and I'll be back. Hats off to the champ. It was awesome. I love that. I love it because there's something for me that's so pure about seeing people dig down deep inside themselves. And I used to wrestle, and I think that had something to do with it because there's no one to blame like if you it's on you and if you win hey there's nobody else to really you know you, you got teammates but there's just something pure for me to see people dig down in life and in that kind of thing that inspires me and um the bible says let let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we're going to reap a harvest if we do not give up there's an if in there if we do not give up and in fighting there's an interesting indicator of who's going to win. Well, actually, there are two that I've noticed over many years of watching. One is focus. You can watch two fighters and a lot of times figure out who's going to win by focus. One can be focused like a predator, focused the whole time, no matter what's coming, kicks, punches, takedowns. He's got like this laser focus in his eyes. Of all things to watch on a fighter, it's his eyes because there's a certain kind of focus where the other person is I kind of, I don't want to get hit, but I'll try this. And it's just a different mode when they're operating. But the second one is endurance. It's, it's endurance. It's, um, there's actually a war of attrition going on. And the better skilled fighter doesn't always win. The question becomes who has the best cardio? A lot of times. Oftentimes a fighter will be doing well, dishing it out to his opponent the first round, second round, going kind of crazy but the opponent keeps taking it, and at some point the tide turns, the momentum shifts, and the one who seemed like the better fighter ends up losing the bout, not because he quit, just because he ran out of gas, ran out of steam, ran out of motivation. And I believe this happens a lot uh, with people, us, fighting the daily battle of walking out our faith. Not everyone finishes well, guys. In fact, most people don't. Somewhere in their journey, things change and the momentum shifts. And it's not that they made a conscious decision to give, to give up. They never actually threw in the towel. They didn't tap. Seems like they just got tired and the fire went out. Have you known people like that? Where you see them five, ten years later, you go, what, 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 ha what happened? It doesn't seem like that fire is there. It doesn't seem like the fighter that I knew. Number two for your notes, everyone gets tired, even Jesus. Even Jesus? Yeah, even Jesus. We were just talking about let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if what? If what? Help me out. If we don't give up. That's today's message. Don't even think about quitting. And, and it talks about becoming weary, and I want you to look what happened. When Jesus went to Samaria, he knew he had to get to the well. There was a woman. He had a, he had a pre-ordained uh, appointment with this woman, whether she knew it or not. It's just before his encounter with her. John 4, 6 says, Jacob's well was there. That's where the encounter took place. Wearied as he was from his journey, Jesus wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. So he gets tired, all right? Fully God, fully man, but in his humanity, he got tired. And he had the famous encounter with the Samaritan woman. She ran and told everybody, and then they believed because of what she said, because of her testimony, but then they wanted to come see him. Then they said, wait, 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 we don't need your testimony anymore because now we've seen the real thing. We believe now because of that. And then they kept him, invited the Jew to the Samaritan village for a couple of days, and all kinds of people got saved. Meanwhile, uh, the disciples were, were urging Jesus, this is in verse 31 and 32, um, hey, eat something. You got to eat something. You've been working and ministering. Eat something. And Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you don't know anything about. So then the disciples said to each other, what? 
Has someone brought him something to eat? Like they're thinking it's food. Who brought him a sandwich? Like Jesus, Jesus said, no, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's what I live on. So Jesus got tired, but he kept his eye on the purpose. He kept his eye on the mission. Fully human. Fatigue is a natural human state. I want to show you just a couple more places. I guess this is just meant to encourage you when you get tired. In Mark 6, 31, Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. Can we do that? He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles, they didn't have time to eat. So very simple. Let's go rest a while. Somebody needs to hear this, that sometimes it's not just okay to rest. You need to go rest. That's why I look at Psalm 23 and it says, He makes me, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And I grip my teeth because I don't want to lie down in green pastures, okay? At least not for very long. But sometimes I hear his voice. I'm laying around for 40 some days and I don't want my kids to see me like that. And I don't want friends to see me like that because I'm not a person who's going to lay around their whole life. But I am. And I'm like, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's what happens. So rest is so important. And when Jesus healed him, if you know the story about the woman who touched his garment, you know, she, 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 I just, I just need to touch him. He's like, who touched me? He felt something go out of him. It cost him strength. It cost him energy. And then after teaching parables all day long to hundreds or thousands of people, and then they finally go out on the boat. And the boat and the waves are, are going crazy, right? They're and starting to go in the boat like it could capsize. I mean, it's a storm. And the, the, <clears throat> the disciples, well, here it is, Mark chapter 4, 38. He was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They're worried, scared to death. Jesus is asleep on the cushion. And we look at that and go, you know, that's great. He has that kind of peace. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? We're going to die here. Well, sure he cared, but he was tired. I mean, how else can you sleep in a storm on a boat? Tired, really tired. But you know what he did? He got up and did something about it. He got up and calmed the wind and the waves by speaking to them in faith. So number three, when you're tired, rest. Put that in all caps. Rest, but don't lose sight of the mission. R-E-S-T. Find out what it means to me. Rest, but don't lose sight of the mission. You guys with me? Yeah. All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 3. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're trying to get ahead of Sundays by sending out in an email or a text some of the verses you might want to study before we get here on Sunday. Somebody asked us for that, and I, I love the idea. So if I can get my stuff together in time and send it out. I'll do that whenever I can. Um, <clears throat> chapter 30, verse 3. It's not in your notes because we were going to put it on the... But I'm going to read it. <laughs> okay. Um, David and his men, first before I read it, has been off dealing with a king and a situation concerning the Philistines. And they leave to return home, back to Ziklag. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at the town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and to, to this region in Ziklag. They had crushed Ziklag, the town that David and his men were, were living, and burned it to the ground and carried off all the family members, women and children, gone. So these men, these warriors, these, this military comes back, and, and here it is in verse 3. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. That's a lot of, that's a lot of weeping. Ever done that? Ever run out of tears? Yeah. Ever just, I just, I run out. Run out of voice, run out of tears. They had no more. And David's two wives, Ahinoam and Jezreel, Jezreelitis, that sounds like a, anyway, and Ab Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, they've been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. This is their great leader. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, 
they're gone. They're going to kill this guy. Look what he got us into. Look what he caused us. Look what he, because of him, I don't have a family anymore. The word says David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Some translations say he encouraged himself. Okay, number, verse 7 says, Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the, the ephod here to me, or the ephod. And Abiathar brought the ephod, and what that is, it's a garment. It's like an apron. It's, it goes over whatever you're wearing, and it's ornate and beautiful, and it's ordained by God. It was for connecting, communing, and having uh, intimate time to hear from God. So he said, bring me that. And the priest brought it to him. David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this troop? God, should I do it? Should I go after him? Should I overtake them? And he answered him, God answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake take them and without fail recover all so David and his troops are returning back to Ziklag found out their families are gone wives and children there's even a bigger battle to come now ahead of them and I believe this situation is relatable to every one of us in this tent today because not because we've had our families stolen but because life is a fight I don't mean to be redundant, but I think we forget life is a fight. And every single one of us on a regular basis is in the middle of a fight. You're fighting to get the bills paid. You're fighting to finish school, fighting to keep your marriage healthy, fighting to go to work, fighting to get a promotion, fighting traffic, fighting to carry that baby for 20 more weeks to full term while the one you have just learned how to run. Where's Lori? She here? Okay. Fighting to raise those kids. Fighting for your health. Fighting the government. Fighting COVID. Fighting to be with people. Fighting not to be with people. <laughs> when you're in the middle of fighting for your health, I mean, can we be honest? It seems like when you're in the middle of fighting for your health, let's say, boom, your car breaks down. Man, the water heater goes out. The dog gets sick. Another family member has a crisis and needs your help. Isn't that how it goes? You're in the middle of fighting one thing. You barely turn around, take a breath, blink your eyes, bam! Something else has come to take you on and take you out. Or is it just me? Almost all of that. And I don't think we should spiritualize every little thing. But the big picture is that that's a manifestation of unclean spirits and pure spirits going at it all around us. We're in the middle. And it is a battlefield. We're on the battlefield. And in many ways, we're what the fight is all about. We are the spoils of war. We're the territory. We're the treasure that the angels, the principalities, the rulers of the unseen world have been fighting over for thousands of years. It's combat duty for your soul. And everything is at stake. We are in a fight. And not to think so is grossly naive and destructive. And this is where David is in his life right now in this passage. He's in the middle of a battle, battle after battle. And at this point, his men have turned against him. They're ready to kill him. And he's on the brink of giving up. How many today, or maybe people you know, because there's always a bifocal kind of thing. This is a message that I need and I want and or I will want or it's going to come in handy for sure, but also know people, because we're all ministers of the good news and the new covenant. So every word that you get, while it is for you, it's also for whoever God puts in your path. And I just wonder how many here today are people that we know are at a point where they're ready to give up. You know, standing at the edge of your circumstances and the precipice of your faith, where hell has thrown everything at you, including the kitchen sink. And life has drained you of your resources and people who promised you that they'd always be there have left you and your will to fight is hard to find. Look at the passage again. Scripture says David encouraged himself. He strengthened himself in the Lord. No wife around. His children weren't there and his commanders and generals had left him. But David strengthened, encouraged himself in the Lord. At some point in your life, you will have to encourage yourself in the Lord. Your mama's not going to do it. Your daddy's not going to do it. Your pastor won't be able to do it. Your spouse won't even be able to do it. You will have to rise up as an individual and talk 
to yourself. I am a child of God. We will get through this. This will not stop me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Number four, nowhere does the Bible encourage giving up. It's not there. Maybe giving up your sins, giving up what's destructive, but nothing that is part of God's plan for you. Are you ever called to give up? Christian, if that's you, say hi. hi. Don't even think about it. Everyone around David had given up and people all around you will give up. And you just need to have the understanding that maybe they're not built like you. Maybe they don't have the same calling. Maybe they don't believe God like you do. When the going gets tough, the child of God gets going. When the odds are stacked against you, when hell tries to move in for the kill and retreat, looks like it's the only option. When it looks like there'll be no way you'll be able to win, your back is flat against the wall and they're closing in on all sides. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Because that's when the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob moves into action. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. So I'm not saying all this to take away from what we talked about the last couple weeks, that sometimes you can't find God, but he's still working, remember that? But then also, uh, we have to come to him empty. That's all true. But when you come to him empty and you encourage yourself in him, that's when he moves into action. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. At the point where you're about to give up, at the point where you're worn out, that's when your strength collapses. Your strength collapses. And the strength of the Lord takes over. David encouraged himself. And it's an important couple things to note. He didn't quit in despair, nor was he consumed by the spirit of pride where he encouraged himself in his own abilities. That is a dead end. I don't care how awesome you are, how sharp you are. I don't care if you got more degrees than a thermometer. I mean, I don't care what, how special you are. You rely on yourself for everything. It is just a matter of time till pride comes before destruction. So David had a crystal clear understanding of where his power was going to come from, and he encouraged himself on, in the Lord. He put on the ephod, and, and the problem with you and me, okay, me and you, is we spend our time beating ourselves up about past mistakes, past bad decisions, past defeats and failures, rather than encouraging ourselves in the Lord we serve. One of my favorite movies, and I know it's one of Ed's too, because we've talked about this, is called The Edge. Anthony Hopkins, Alec Baldwin, some other good people. I mean, it's a great movie, probably rated R for the profanity, but man, this movie. They crash in Alaska, in a plane crash, and it's cold, it's Alaska, right? They survive the plane crash, but pretty soon they're hungry, they're freezing, and they're lost, and they have no communications, and there's no way to get back to civilization, and now there's a bear chasing them, a big bear, a big Alaskan grizzly bear. And, um, and so they go on this journey, and they try to make a compass, and they go on this long hike. I think it's a day, maybe a two days, and they go on this big, long walk, and then they come back to a place, and they realize they're in the same place they started when they made the compass. And Alec Baldwin's character predictably is sitting on a tree stump crying. <laughs> Sorry, a little crack at Alec, take it back. Anyway, <laughs> crying, bleeding, the base is one step ahead of us. No matter where we go, it's useless, it's useless. And Anthony Hopkins, a billionaire, he's read every book there is, and he knows, and he's chill, and he's cool, and he's like, you want to die out here, right? He said, no, I don't want to die, but this is worthless, it's useless, I don't even, what's the point? He goes, you know why people die in the wilderness? Why? Why do they die in the wilderness? Like, here it comes. He goes, they die of shame. They die of shame. They sit there and they wallow like you're doing and they go, how did I get here? This is such a mess. We screwed everything up and they beat themselves up and they just just sit there in a spirit of shame and they're paralyzed instead of doing the one thing that they should do in the movie. It's think and act. In this movie, in our life, it's encourage yourself in the Lord. It is get down on your knees, stop wallowing about how you got here and why, and get on with it, and don't die of shame in the wilderness. Amen, Ed? Fist bump, man. That's awesome. So the next time you're in this situation, remind yourself and all those who oppose you who you serve. Remind yourself, Exodus 14, 14, the Lord shall fight for me, and I will hold my peace. 
Remind yourself of Psalm 18 too. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strong rock. In him I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower. Whom shall I fear? Remind yourself. Deuteronomy 3.22, I shall not fear for the Lord my God. He shall fight for me. Remind yourself, Romans 8.37, I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Remind yourself, Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Remind yourself, Isaiah 54.17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That's all in your notes. Remind yourself. Because here's what I believe caused the most problems in your life and in my life, and it's summed up by Jesus. It's not something, I mean, it's in the book of Matthew. I've read it, but I never, it really struck me different this week. He sums it up. He's talking directly to the Sadducees, and it's Matthew 22, verse 29. He's talking to the Sadducees, the religious leaders. And you might, sometimes when I hear that, you know, you might kind of go, well, he's talking to religious leaders. Well, what are you? Right? Right? You're a disciple. You're a follower of Christ. That means you're a shepherd. You're a shepherd. Feed my sheep. You think that was just for Peter? That's for all of us. Wherever you go, God has called you not only to live a life of abundance and fruitfulness and power, but also to live a life that guides and affects others for the glory of God. Do you realize that you're called to shepherd others? You might think that's the pastor's job. Well, within the context of the church, there are shepherds and under shepherds. We're all under shepherds under Jesus Christ. But you're all, in some way, pastors, elders, deacons, small group leaders, family leaders, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, salt, light, wherever you go. We are called to feed God's sheep. So Jesus makes this statement right in the middle of the Gospel of Matthew. He says, your mistake, go ahead and fill that in. I want to know what my mistake is. Do you? Your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures And you don't know the power of God. How many times do we really just know scripture? Not for, I mean, just just open it. Eat it. Just, it's a foundational problem in our lives. We don't know the scripture. We don't get into the word. And I'm not talking about everybody. So if it's not you, God bless you. Help some of us. We don't get in the word and stay in the word and swim in the word and Tread water in the word and meditate on the word and memorize the word and apply the word and study the word and speak the word and pray the word until the word of God is inscribed on the tablet of our heart and it comes out of us like it's part of us in everything we say and everything we do in our actions and in our deeds. And this is one of the many reasons why we should have Bible verses memorized in our heart because life can be unpredictable. And in some situations, you won't have the time or the opportunity to open up your Bible and find it right then and right there. Adverse situations rise up all the time. You could be out and about. You could be at work. You just might not be in a position to open up your Bible and find out what you're looking for, or find what you're looking for. But if you have Isaiah 54 memorized, you can whisper to yourself, bless you, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It's powerful. And we need to speak the word of God into the situations in our life. Speak the word of God directly into those circumstances. Speak it into the reality of what's going on and watch a new reality take place and overcome. Learn scripture, guys. Speak it into your life so that it helps you with the challenges that you're facing. Not only memorize it, not only speak it, but encourage yourself like David did so you can persevere in faith. No Christian is ever a victim of their circumstances feels like it sometimes but we're not if you wake up in the morning you know that today is going to be a difficult day encourage yourself talk to yourself as your feet hit the floor talk to yourself while you're getting ready you could be you could be standing in the shower shampooing your hair and declare Deuteronomy 33 25 over your day as the days are so shall thy strength be and the water washes over your body and the word washes over your day And the harder your day, the greater the strength God is going to give you. And the bigger your obstacle, the bigger the power that God's going to impart in you to overcome it. If you're fighting an illness, remind yourself, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Psalm 118, 17. 
This is not the end for me. I am not finished. I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. I mean, some of us need to stop relying on other people to pick us up. And the sooner we do, the sooner we'll get to the real rescue boat. It's a harsh reality for some people. People out in the world, they don't really care about your situation. Not in a way that makes a difference. Thank God we have a wonderful church community and church family here. Thank God. And we do look out for each other. We do bear one another's burdens and we do pray for each other. And our lives are infinitely better because we are in a community of faith. And it's real and it's powerful and it's comforting and it makes an incredible difference. Um, Just a quick side note while we're on that note, and I have permission to share. um, Mike and Renee uh, have a a son-in-law named Patrick. It's mm, Renee's oldest daughter, Michelle's sister. Um, Been in the hospital for a week or two battling COVID and a bunch of stuff. And he went to heaven last night at about 7 or 8 o'clock. And uh, I don't know, 6, whatever time. Um, Got five boys. Um, grown, but I just wanted to share because Marlena, her daughter needs prayer, the family needs prayer, the boys need prayer, and we do that for each other, and it is priceless. Like, you never forget some of the things you go through with people in times of trial, but please pray for the family, pray for them. Um, That all being said, we need to understand Psalm 46. It says God is our refuge and our strength. So we we do this together. But God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. God is our refuge and our strength. Did you hear that? It doesn't say people are a present help in times of trouble. It doesn't say people are a refuge in our strength. And while it's true that God may choose to send help through people, the Bible says the kind of help that's on the way doesn't come from humans. People have issues of their own, battles of their own. They can and will at times turn on us in an instant like the wind. People turned on David and he was their hero. He was anointed to be king. The women used to dance And sing songs about him. Saul chased a thousand. David chased ten thousand. And they turned on him. And we think we're exempt from that kind of treatment, especially from friends. And I'm certainly not talking about everybody, but I'm saying people can and will turn on you or just become absent. It happens. But don't even think about quitting. That's right. Because you have a God. A God who wants you to encourage yourself in him. That's why the Bible says, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Not be strong in yourself, not in your might, but in him. And if you do that and you don't quit, you can't lose. If you do that and you don't quit, you cannot lose. Let me tell you something. Your body, say my body, body. is the house of your spirit. spirit. Say my spirit, okay? Your body, but you have a spirit that lives in that body. But if you're a Christian, somebody else lives in your house. It is not a single, single occupancy dwelling. Somebody else is in there besides you. Somebody tell me who else is in there. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit shout it out. Holy Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And greater is he that is in you. Someone say, in me than he that is in the world. Greater, stronger, bigger, faster, more consistent, more powerful, greater. So do me a favor, put both your hands on your heart right now, both of them, and just say greater like you mean it. Say it louder like you mean it. Greater. Greater. Say it again. Greater. Greater. The greater one is in me and lives big in me. Is that in your notes? Okay, write that in. The greater one is in me and lives big in me so you don't even think about quitting. I'm going just a little bit longer today, but this is what God gave me. See, 
I could have told you all kinds of stories of people who persevered. There's a lot of stories out there of people who had an impossible situation and yet they stuck with it and they stuck with it no matter what came at them and they persevered and this is what happened at the end. And those stories are out there. If you need them, go find them. But that's not where God led me today because you're people of God and you're people of faith and you have a story of your own. So look back at your life. All the hell you've been through. All the heartbreak you've endured. All the challenges and the trials. All the phonies. Some betrayers. When people talked about you and they said that stuff. All the hurdles you've had to overcome. All the impossible challenges you faced. God was with you. He's still with you. He hasn't taken his eyes off you, not for a second. And he hasn't brought you this far to leave you in this situation. God is for you. He has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And regardless of the situation that you're going through, this is not the end for you. You were born for this time. Recognize that. You were born for this time in history. You were born to carry out God's plan in you. And you're the vessel, and these are the times. And it might be a time for you to cry, because those times come, but believe me, you'll get through this. Believe God, you will get through this. With God, there, there are promises. Not one of them has ever been unkept, failed to come true. With God, there are promises, and there's a process. We don't like the process. We love the promises. But in many cases, you've got to go through the process in order to get to the promise. But there's nothing the devil can do to halt either one of them. He can't stop the process, and he can't stop the promise, and he knows he can't stop God. All he can do, maybe, is influence God's people to alter things a little through discouragement, through apathy, through fatigue, through complacency, but we cannot let that happen. The difficulties we walk through are not the final verdict. Amen? Amen. So weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. You know what it says after that? We usually stop right there. It says his favor is for life. Yeah. Do you know that? Look it up. Psalms 34. Verse 5, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. His favor is for life. So the last one for your notes, I believe, quitting, please write down, don't even think about it. Not an option. God's got you. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And, and there's a crown of righteousness not worthy to be compared to anything that we go through down here. So don't even think about quitting, okay, guys? There's just too much at stake. I hope the Lord spoke to you through that. Um, we're about to enjoy communion. We usually do this the first, we've started to do this on the first week of every month. If you're ever here and you want to take communion and it's not a communion day, you can ask for it from our prayer teams. We'll have the elements here. Um, Communion is the body and blood of Christ, and it's represented by wine or grape juice and these and little wafers, bread. And it's a sacrament. It's a practice commended by Jesus himself, instituted at the Last Supper when Jesus was with his disciples. Communion is for the family, the family of faith, the church family, those who believe in what Jesus did for us. That's an important thing to recognize if you're going to take communion. Everybody's welcome to the table, but you got to believe. That's the prerequisite. Everybody's welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my friend. But you got to believe. And the Bible says nobody should partake of communion in what he calls an unworthy manner. So what's an unworthy manner? Well, flippant, <laughs> casual, without reverence, without the recognition and acceptance of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He gave his life as a ransom for the sins of many. See, we sinned. We are separated from God in that way, and there's no way back, at least not on our own. But God sent Jesus as a sinless, spotless lamb to be sacrificed as a payment for the sin of the world. It's the greatest gift 
in all of history. And it's free. It's free. Why do we love free stuff so much when it's little trinkets, little bonuses, little BOGO, buy one, get one, go here, we'll drive half hour to get something for free. <laughs> but when it comes to the big things, We don't feel that way sometimes. I mean, this gift of salvation, it, it, it's eternal life. It means being with God forever. It is free, but you do have to ask for it. You have to ask Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sins, and to run your life. You have to make him your Lord, not just your Savior, but your Lord and your Savior. So before we take communion, anybody want to do that? Amen. Amen. Why don't we all do that together by a show of hands? If you recognize Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, can I see your hands? I better see them all. If not, I'm going to tackle you and pray for you. <laughs> Lay hands on you <laughs> with prayer. Well, all of us will get you. Um, if you'd like him to forgive him of all your sins, Please just shout out, forgive me. Yes. Forgive me. Tell him I'm yours. I'm yours. We acknowledge him before men. Not just in the safety of a church, but hopefully anywhere. Well, how do you do? I'm, I belong to Jesus. I'm a follower of Christ. I think I know a solution for what you're going through. Can I share it with you? His name is Jesus. Acknowledge him and ask him to run your life. Now let's break out the bread and the wine. All right? Bread will be first. The symbols of Jesus' body and blood right here. And on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body given up for you. Kind of weird for them back then. A little bit weird for us now. We go, how's this? It's a symbol. It is representation of something that he wants us to do. And um, he said, as you do it, do it in the remembrance of me. Don't forget. Don't do it in an unworthy manner. Like, understand this. And bread is an everyday common thing. And I think Jesus fully meant for us to take communion often in private or with the church to do something that's everyday bread. As much as my food, remember, as much as the bread that I eat, give us this day our daily bread. And as much as I give it, much as I eat it, I'm remembering what he did for me. Today we've been talking about not giving up. Jesus never gave up on us. Oh, there's a time where he looked for another way. You can read about it. Take your time when you do. I mean, Dad, can we do this a different way? I'm sweating blood. Literally. It's blood coming out of the pores of this fully human Christ. Dad, can I just stop being me for a little while? 